las herencias. Amen. Amen. Again, welcome to today's press briefing. Uh, with us today, we have um, a team from the audit service here. You. We all know that for now, uh, um, the issue of audit is the most topical issue around town now. So that's why uh, the team is here from the audit service here you, to to highlight on the issues in the latest audit reports. Uh, in the absence of uh, the regular news brief, I would uh, call on the honorable deputies of information to give us some opening remarks, and then later our guests will uh, do their presentation. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Joe. Um, so on behalf of the Ministry of Information and Communications, we want to uh, welcome a very, uh, and this delegation is headed by no less a person, Mr. Mori Lansana, the Assistant Auditor General, uh, Audit Service Sierra Leone. Uh, and when he takes the floor, he would introduce to us the other members of his delegation. And we thought it was important for us to devote this particular session to talk about audit, um, not just the the, the um, audit reports under review, but he may also wish to speak to other processes and help us get a sense of, uh, because until you have the broader picture, until you have an appreciation of the context, you may all run the risk of proffering explanations or analysis and doing so um, on an erroneous assumption. And so it is important for the audit CRLU to come and just shed some light, critical light, on the current report, also perhaps certain matters uh, prior there to, and even in the aftermath. We all appreciate as Sierraleans and as people who are avid campaigners of good governance that one of the most important institutional decisions that any responsible country of government would have to take is to ensure that your audit institution is properly configured, it has the relevant independence, and it speaks to transparency and accountability. For us as a government, we thought it was not just sufficient to be bringing ministries, departments, agencies to talk about successes of government, but it's also important that we talk about challenges as well, so that we speak to all of those within the general scope of things. So it is my singular honor and pleasure to give the floor to the Assistant Auditor General of Sierra Leone, the quintessential professional himself, um, someone who has carved a niche for himself, well respected, not just in Sierra Leone but beyond. And so I give the floor on that note to Mr. Maury Lansana, the Assistant Auditor General, to talk to us about the current audit report and other matters that they consider to be pertinent for Sierra Leoneans to take note of. Mr. Lansana, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I want, on behalf of the acting auditor general for the service radio staff. Management and Board of Body Service at home to wish all of you a prosperous 2023. The Acting AG extend greetings to you, our brothers and sisters in the Fort Estates. And as an institution, we do appreciate the work that you have been doing on the audit service alone since 
2004 to date. We do appreciate that. And we do hope we will all continue in this direction because if Sierra Leone is to be where we all expect it to be, then your role should not be underestimated. We do value you and we do hope you will continue in that direction. With me, it's our Information and Communication Officer, Mr. Mati Sandi. Mr. Sandi, you will say hi to people, eh? And also, in our midst, is another gentleman, I know you know him. He was part of, uh, interestingly, both of them that I will be introducing we are, we are part of the ministry. Uh, years ago, but they are now with us, still rendering services for Masara Leon. Another gentleman is Mr. Baba Khan. Baba is with the editorial team. So if uh, our report comes out, you see the way it is. It means this ministry has trained people to do diligent service to Sierra Leone, and they are now with the service contributing in that direction. Baba, thank you. Thanks to the ministry for hosting us. And uh, my discussion with you this afternoon will be in the following form. One, why audit service are you now? No other institution. Then number two, I will go briefly through the processes and procedures as Supreme Audit Institution we, we undertake for us to arrive at the output everybody always look up to, that is the audit reports. And then I will look at issues in the 2021 audit reports, talk on challenges and successes of the audit service area, and then what we intend to do going forward. Now, why audit service area? This office is not a new office. For those of you who don't know, or probably may have heard, this was an office actually enacted by law, Act Number no. 7 of 1962. So it was called the Audit Department. In our books, it is called the Office of the Audit General. But in 1991, that is the 1991 constitution that now exists, there is a provision there that talks about this particular office, the Office of the Auditor General. Section 119, there are about 14 subsections in Section 119, just talks about this particular office. But I will talk about some of the provisions in Section 119 relating to audit service side. The office of the Auditor General. The first one I will talk about is the section 119, subsection 1. That one deals with the appointment of the person that actually heads this important office. And the provision is clear there that the president, in consultation with the Public Service Commission, uh, appoints somebody to be an Auditor General of Sierra Leone. And we all know every appointment by the President has to receive parliamentary assent. So meaning approval has to be sought from Parliament for that individual to be the Auditor General of Sierra Leone. So that is how somebody that comes in and heads this office to come in. That is the process that it takes. Subsection 2 of Section 119 now gives us the mandate, the mandate why Audit Service Sierra Leone, why no other institution but Audit Service Sierra Leone when it comes to auditing public offices. And that one is in the provision of Section 119, Subsection 2. That is where our primary mandate to audit is that we audit all public institutions, be it the courts, the universities, 
the local government administration or public offices that receives money for and on behalf of the divorce are shall be audited. And the interesting part of that provision is that in the course of us doing that work, that audit work, we must have access to all books, returns, sites, etc., etc. So the, the, the provision is so clear and the mandate is so clear that when the auditor general triggers its function, under the provision of the 1991 Constitution, you should have unlimited access to whatever that is required of him. Also, in the same 1991 Constitution, Section 119, sub Section 4, it now says when you complete all of this work that you do, the Auditor General must report any irregularities that comes to his attention. And in, in this professional judgment, that needs to be brought to the people of Sierra Leone. And that report must be sent to Parliament on or before the end of the financial year. Now, the report that you see year and year that is produced by the Auditor General is as a result of just complying with the constitutional provision at, at the end of every year, a report must be sent to Parliament. Now, people may want to know what report. We are in 2023. 2023 will end, and the Auditor General has to submit a report. Financial management provisions have been made. The Public Financial Management Act made provision. The account that is being spoken about in the Constitution is the Public Account of Australia or the Government Account. Now, who prepares that account? We all know that we have an accountant general of Sierra Leone under the Ministry of Finance. He is our chief accountant. The Public Financial Management Act made it very clear that immediately three months after the immediate preceding financial year, we are in 2023, so the immediate preceding financial year is 2022. So three months after the end of the immediate preceding financial year, so three months after the end of 2022, will be March 2023. What does the act say? The accountant general must now put all the activities of government, be it revenue, be it expenditure, be it public debts, as the case may be, in the form of a report. That report is what we call the financial statement. That is the report that is submitted to the Auditor General for auditing. So we are waiting for that report. So we are in 2023. The report that will be sent to Parliament come on or before December 2023 will be the report that will be submitted by the Accountant General, which we call the financial statement of the general proposed financial statement that will be reported on based on the professional judgment of the Auditor General. That is the report that we report. But also in the same constitution, section 119 sub section 6, it says in the course of carrying out its functions, the Auditor General shall not be under the directive of anybody. So in the course of our work, this work, this mandate that is given to the Auditor General in section 119 sub section Nobody detects to the Auditor General how that function has to be performed. Nobody. However, there is a caveat there. However, if President, in his wisdom, through Parliament, wants the Auditor General to carry a function, a specific function, maybe this is a request, this in this case, it is a request. If a request comes from either Parliament or the Presidency, now, because section one and saw section six say nobody should die, so it has to be a request coming. So if that request comes and the resources are there, the means are there, mm -hmm. then the auditor general will undertake the work. But in the course of that work, how it plans, how it determines what to test, nobody dies. Mm -hmm. That was the more reason why you see sometimes in 2018 when a request was made by His Excellency the President for a technical audit. 
to be undertaken. That was a request that was made, and we all saw a technical audit that we did, and a report was issued, same processes and procedures. We are a public office, and as shares, we too are subjected to the same scrutiny like we do for other institutions. But in our own case, Parliament has to appoint auditors to audit the operations of all the services are used. The same money that you get, the same boss, is the same boss like any other ministry, department, and agencies. Who are part of government. When the plug is in. Now, why audit services are in the constitution talks about the audit department or the office of the auditor general. In 1998, there was an act called the Audit Service Act of 1998. This act actually creates this office we call today the office, the audit service scenario. So it was a transformation. What's the difference? In the 1991 constitution, up, up to the promulgation of the 1998 audit service act, the audit department was part of the civil service. So it means it was even housed by the Minister of Finance. We are under the Minister of Finance. It was part of the civil service. Meaning the same recruitment okay. processes like any other civil service that is being recruited and the same directive or procedures like any other civil service. But to the promulgation of the 1998 Act, yeah. we now move from a civil service. We are a public office, but outside the civil service. What was the beauty in this arrangement? The beauty was one, we now had a board, the audit service board, that was actually charged with the responsibility of recruiting from the position of deputy auditor general. Remember, the auditor general is appointed by the president. But the structure of the audit service says that we have four deputies, yeah. We have four assistant officers or generals, mm -hmm. they will have other divisional mm -hmm. units, technical mm -hmm. and corporates. Mm -hmm. So the two mm -hmm. aspects are there. We have technical mm -hmm. units and we have corporate mm -hmm. units. That's how the structure is. So all other staff, uh, actually the recruitment of all other staff is the responsibility of the board. And the board sets the salary or terms and conditions as well for those staff. Now. In 2014, more powers, more responsibilities, and more expansion on responsibilities were made on the audit service operations. And then in 2014, we also have the Audit Service Act of 2014. So that's the beauty. That's how it is. And in the Act, the Audit Service Act that we are talking about, there are areas where sanctions are even mentioned, even some of our responsibilities that are in order public financial management instruments that are being used to are now brought in our own fold, like the functions of the Auditor General, they are now in the Audit Service Act, and even uh, litigation issues where we don't get compliance from clients when we go to audit, where the Auditor General deems it necessary, then those issues, if, if at all, if for any reason, has to uh, require some litigation, then those issues are actually in the act ladies and gentlemen I can hear you. this is the office that you now call audit service alone the supreme audit institution so it's not a new office that's just a brief synopsis of this all important office from audit department office of the auditor general and now the audit service alone that everybody cares about we are housed at the Freedom City Council building, the new building, the 12th and the 11th floor. And also, uh, some of the staff are at the 9th floor at the Q building here. But equally so, we have offshoots. Sierra Leone is not free job. We have uh, regional offices in Makeni that is charged with the responsibility of carrying out the Auditor General's mandate. In the northern region, we have office in Kenema, charged with similar responsibility for the eastern region, and an office in Bo for the southern region. We have also have an office at the Ministry of Works, branches there, accommodation is given. We are scattered. But however, we are on the construction, and we hope with the support of government at the Tower Hill, sooner or later we'll have 
our own building that we house all of the staff in Britain, for example, for easy coordination and uh, supervision. Now, having said this, I think we'll talk about the audit process. This is what we do. At the start of every financial year, for us, the financial year, the year 2023 that we all celebrate to be a new year, is our financial year for the audit of 2020 account. So meaning 2020 has just ended, we are now preparing for the audit of 2020. What do we do? Where people go for holidays, all these service, we don't have holidays. The only holidays that we celebrate are the public holidays that is given to every public official. Our job is round the clock, 360. When we completed the time set for the 2021 audits, we immediately went into motion to start planning for the 2023 activities, 2022 activities. Now, so getting towards the end of the year, we sit all of the units, be it corporate or technical, we sit, we all have portfolios. These are looked into, and we have to rate all our clients. We have so many clients, so many. Let's take schools alone. We have over 10,000 schools. Ministry of Education, give that data. So many schools. Take the public health units, the VHUs, the chief of councils, the ministries, the department. There are so many. We have that database, so we cannot audit all of them at one go. What do we do? We have what you call interest areas that determine how we attach or assign risk, how we rank our clients. What are some of these interest areas? One, we will now look at the budgetary allocations of government to all of those institutions that we are talking about. So we we'll take one, for example, budget. As he asked him, which areas have government spent a lot of money within this particular period under review? We we'll consider that as one factor. Remember, where government money goes, that is where we expect services to be delivered to the people and assess we need to give assurance because we are assurance givers as to whether public monies are being utilized the way they are being appropriated by parliament and allocated to the individual ministries by the Ministry of Finance, as the case may be. Two, public interest. We also listen to you. Public outcry. Where are public interest? Where? Is it on water? Is it on electricity? Is it on roads? So in the course of the year, like for the whole of 2022, we are taking stock of what are some of these things. Every day on a daily basis, the IC officer buys all of the newspapers in this country on a daily basis. We don't buy them for, for fun's sake. As individuals, we like reading. For those who want to read, we read news. But as an institution, we take data of information that will be key in our planning. Three, don't know interest. We all know Sierra Leone on a day-to-day -day basis. If public officials talk today, they will explain to you the level of support that we are getting from donors. So their interest money, remember, donors' money are also equally taxpayers' money, other taxpayers' money. They may want to know whether the monies that they give, the support that they are giving, are actually being utilized for the intended purposes. So look at the interest of that. Government interest. Every government comes with its own agenda. The current government is talking about what? Education. Not so. So, if it is education, then education should be primary. In fact, our primary interest. So, all of these things that I'm talking about are put together. Revenue generation is the entity generating revenue. We know we rely on revenue on a daily basis for government to get money. So, we put all of these together and they run. We give them ratings. So, based on those ratings, the outcome. Now, determines which entities we should prioritize in our audience. And if we can confirm that if all of what I've spoken about are concerns and they are rated 
five, 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 for example, high, then it means the outcome definitely will be high. So all of those that will be given those highest ratings are those that we consider first. So in selecting our clients, that is the instrument to use. We don't just sit because the audit service is actually charging the responsibility of audit in public institution. So therefore, we decide institution A, you have to be audited this year and you will not be audited next this year. No. There is something that guides. And all of us, I'm talking about this guidance. These are benchmarks for best practices based on international standards that govern the operation of supreme audit institutions. So it therefore means that the same benchmark that we use in Sierra Leone is the same benchmark that is being used everywhere in the world for similar institutions like ours. Now, once those institutions are selected by individual divisions, we have a specialized unit. Those ones, they look at subject matter. We call them subject matter expert. That's why we call them specialized unit. That is why the performance audit unit, the information system audit units. These are special specialities. They are specialists in there. For them, they do a lot of research work, in fact, based on one, the economy, two, the effectiveness, three, and the efficiency. We call it value for money audit that they do. So it's not a matter of whether things have been done or are they, how long would they, they last with what would be the benefits. So they are specialists. So since they are specialists, their own audits are subject matter based. They will look for a case, develop it, and then work towards that case and produce the, an audit report in that same line. I will highlight some of the audit report that comes out of those exercises. Now, what are the type of audit that now comes out of it? It can either be financial, compliance, or performance audit, as the case may be. Once those entities are identified, we have timeline given to them when we will start and when we will end. We have what we call cut-off dates in our plan. The cut-off date is when all of these issues will be looked at, they will be audited, finalized, and then submitted to a committee for the production of the reports that always come out called the auditor general's annual reports. When we are ready, time is now ready for us to get into action with our individual clients. What do we do? We communicate to them in the form of a letter we call engagement letter. We write, please take note of this. We don't just go in like a thief in the night. No. We are not there to critique anybody. We don't go in to find fault from anybody. We go in to evaluate your systems. It is systems that we go in to look at and see whether controls are working well and see where weaknesses are we recommend for their improvement. That is just what you do. Reasonable assurance as to how those entities operate. We write to them. In that letter, we will tell them the mandate that we have to do, the job that we are doing. What is their responsibility? What is our responsibility? It's like a social contract. And then we say, if you think all of what we spelled out in this letter, you are okay with it, please sign and send a return a copy. We send two of them. Please sign and return a copy to us that you are okay. They will sign and send copies. And they will agree on the date and time when we will come and sit them down to explain. So even after signing the letter, we will come. Sit to them, we call that an entrance meeting, initial meeting. The entrance meeting is where we now discuss if they have challenges, whatever concerns they may have about the audit, we explain all the audit process to them and whatever challenges they may have, we discuss. These are preliminary engagement to the clients. In that meeting, we expect all key stakeholders or players in the accountability field for that particular entity and within the particular scope to be present. Once that meeting is held, an accommodation is given to the audit team within the premise. Why? We have to be very close to them and it is a requirement. It is a statutory requirement that once the auditor general wants to perform his function, you have to provide accommodation to the clients. We now come. First, 
Wise in the field. We try as much as possible to understand the operation. We don't understand. We don't have any idea. We will come and now ask. Schedule interviews. Talk to people that matter. We schedule interviews. We talk to you. We will come to you and you explain to us what you do or what you do not. All of those things, why do we need to understand your system? It's the only way that you can assess this and place resources where they are needed. That's the only way that you now know uh, here we, there are control weaknesses. This is where we put our resources and this is where we need to work more for things to work or to add the value that you need to add. Once that is done, remember you may have done a lot, a lot of transactions. But after completing our interview, maybe, for example, you may have done 1,000 transactions during 2020. But after completing our, 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 our interview and assessing the risk, we will now say, okay, out of this 1,000 transaction, we are not going to look at all. We will do what we call a risk base. Where the risk is high, that is where the resources will go. We will say, out of this 1,000 transaction, the areas where the risk is high, it's just 200 transactions. So that is the area that will focus our resources. But remember, because we've spoken to you, we've understood the system well, and then we've classified. This is not just my own opinion or somebody's opinion or the auditor on the field. Based on standards that we follow, trust me, with that 200 sample that we've taken, whatever conclusion that we come out of that 200, it is still possible that it, it is true for if Are you tested all of them? The 1,000 transaction. So that is how we do our risk. Now, in the course of our testing, the sample transaction, when we observe deviations from what ought to be, the one what ought to be are the financial management guidelines, either procurement, expenditure, revenue, as the case may be, because for every unit, that you manage in terms of financial management, you have guiding principles. For procurement, the procurement laws are there to tell you what to do and what not to do in terms of procurement. For expenditure, you have the financial management act and financial management regulation. Even your own internal controls that you develop for the effective management of your entity, all of those things are okay. But in the course of us looking into it, that is where we request for documents just to corroborate whether what you've said you do and the steps you say you did. Or you have been doing whether it correlates with the document that is the evidence on hand. If we see deviations, we discuss with you at first hand. Why is the team is there? If you are not available for the discussion, we issue audit queries. If at the time of discussion we are satisfied with your explanation based on evidences that are submitted to us, those issues will never come up. It means we are satisfied with what you have done. If queries are issued and you respond to those queries backed by evidence and those issues are satisfactorily addressed, those issues will never surface. That's what we do. We do it for individual units. Then at the end of the field exercise, the time that we have been given to the auditors to complete those field exercises, at the end of the field exercise, those issues are now collated. They are now collated and then they are again discussed. Before we leave the premise, what you call the exit meeting is held. When we are coming, an entrance meeting was held. When we are leaving your premise, we do an exit meeting. What do we discuss in the exit meeting? Are all of those outstanding issues that individual or responsible units or entities or departments within an entity we are unable to address? These are the things we discuss. So if, for example, the director sitting here with visited the director, for example, we are now doing Ministry of Information, and we handled issues around the director for which the director was responsible, and those issues, the director addressed them as a unit. They will not discuss that issue at the exit meeting. Initially, it is between us and the director as a unit. But when it comes to the exit, then everybody is now aware of what has been happening in the directorate units. Now, at the exit meeting, it is again another opportunity. So, please take note of the field exercise. The first opportunity is engaging. The second opportunity that has been given, queries issued for you to respond, for you to address the issue. The third one is at the exit meeting. Why should I? We will discuss these issues again. And they will still request for 
explanations, clarifications, and additional documentation as the case may be. If those documents are submitted, fine, kudos, clap, excellent, because that is what we exist for, added value. The only way those values are observed is when you act on our recommendation. If you fail to address those issues at that exit meeting, we will go to our office, go back, and then put a document together called a draft management report. Please take note of the word draft. We are still work in progress. It is still a work in progress. And in that draft management report, those outstanding issues that we fail to address whilst we are in the team are now put together and communicated to the vote controller, the head of the entity. For what again? For response. Now it is regulated. In the PFM Act, it says upon receipt of any query from the Auditor General, the vote controller must respond within 15 days. So upon receipt of the query, when we send the management report to you, we indicate that provision on the public page that you have to respond to us within 15 days. When you respond, no problem. If you fail to respond, then the Auditor General has the mandate to write to the Accountant General for the withholding of the salary of the vote controller. So if you fail to respond within 15 days, without explanation, most times some people communicate to See the flexibility. There are times you communicate to people, he said, because of some reason, we cannot meet your 15 days deadline. Please allow us to respond after 15 days, maybe one month because of the challenges. We listen to them. But once you respond, we will come to validate your response. We now compare what you said in your response and the evidences that you have to support your response with regards to the recommendation made. Please do not we are focusing on the recommendation. Once those issues are clear, you respond well, you submitted evidences to corroborate with our findings and the recommendations. We have no business with you. We say kudos to you. Thank you very much for acting on our recommendation. We say that issue is resolved. But what happens if we come and the issues are still there? They will still indicate it that yes, you responded, oh, you said this, oh, this was what you recommended. But based on the evidences that you've given to us, they cannot address the issues as identified. Or you responded, oh, but you failed to submit evidence is to support your response in addressing the issue. There are instances where people will respond and submit some of the evidences to address the issue, but not all. So we tell the story as we see. So if it is some that you address, we comment on it that you address some. If it is all that you address, we will still comment that you address all, as the case may be. Then we go. Not stop there. We sent you a verification report. Now the verification report is you now responded. We will verify. They will tell you that this is the outcome. This is the final outcome. The final outcome based on our verification. If you agree, please sign and send one copy to us. They will sign and send the verification. Can you turn that thing we still don't stop there. But when we sit on the signed verification report, maybe there are some instances when we send the verification report, that will be the time additional documents come. If those documents are, we still consider them. Then after all of those considerations, we now issue what we call the final management letter. Another note, please. The first one was a draft management letter. Now this is the final. From the word final, it means we have used all available resources and all available avenues to address this issue. So when we put the word final there, it means we are now in agreement with the clients that they are okay with the job that we've done, which we are okay based on the timeline given and based on the processes that we they will issue the final management letter. Now, in that final management letter, the stories as explained to you will be told. One, those issues that we are okay with. We are clear when we issue the draft report, it will be explained in the final management letter. Those issues that you are partially addressed, it will be explained in the final management letter. Those issues that you are not addressed at all, 
It will be explained in the final management. And for you to corroborate the story well, there is what you call the auditor's comment. The auditor's comment is the verification comment that is being made by us. We put it in the final management letter. So it tells the correct story. Now that is what the final management letter. And from the word management letter, the issues in there are for management consumption, so that management takes action on what we identify in the course of our audits. Is that clear to all of us? Now, let's move on. This is management letter. But well, are they the only output when we do field work? No. There are instances where institutions do prepare financial statement and submit it to us. Like the prior status, the public enterprises. They prepare financial statement based on their creations, based on the acts that created, like the NACI, the NRA, the banks, the commissions. They prepare financial statement and submit them to us. And we audit and report on those financial statements. So for them, two reports goes to them. One is the opinion of the Auditor General on those financial statements. Two, the management letter. Let me talk small about the audit opinion. The responsibility of the Auditor General is to express an opinion on the financial statements. What is that opinion? The professional view of how the financial statements has been prepared and submitted. So if in the Auditor General's judgment, professional judgment, that the financial statement has been prepared well in all respects, then an unqualified audit opinion will be issued. Unqualified, meaning clean audit opinion. But there may be a clean audit opinion, but yes, you have management letter issues to address. Now, if in his judgment, the financial statements says otherwise, that is, they were not prepared in accordance to the standards, the laws, then he will say so. How? A modification of opinion will be issued. Modification falls under, the following are under the modification. Now, one, you can issue a qualified audit opinion. Qualify, don't miss our own term, qualify means it was unsatisfactory. But like in schools, you can have poor, very poor. So even unsatisfactory, there are those that are except for. There are those, they say, except for one, two issues, the other issues are correct, but for these two issues, no, no, they are not correct. So meaning that is an unqualified, a, quali a qualified opinion. But also, it can issue an adverse opinion, wherein the issues are so material and so pervasive that it has an impact on the operations of the entity. So these are the type of opinions. So the opinion can be either unqualified or unmodified, or a modified audit opinion. So for those institutions that prepare financial statements, two reports, the opinion on the accounts, and then the management letter, these are the two that goes out. Now, what do we do with outstanding material or substantial issues in the final management report? Towards the end of the year, the Auditor General will now look at all of the issues that are outstanding in all of the reports that are spoken about, and then he also evaluates what goes into the report. For Auditor General's annual report, it's only substantial issues, material issues, as espoused by the Constitution. So they will now look at every entity by entity, entity by entity, entity by entity. At entity level, we will consider issues. So every entity, those outstanding issues are extracted. Those outstanding issues are extracted by entity. But we are now taking it to one book where it is consolidated. Then the benchmark is set. As long as issues don't meet that benchmark, they are not substantial and material in nature. They don't attract the auditor general support. Maybe those management report that I was talking about those support is for the consumption of who? The entity. But for auditor general support, everybody is aware of it. Not only Sierra Leone, it is an international report. It is on our website. And all of what goes in there has to meet international benchmarks. As an institution, Supreme Audit Institution, we have guiding principles. So issues that get in there has to be those guiding principles. Then that is how issues get in there. So all of those outstanding issues that are material and substantial, then they get into the Auditor General's report. And in that report, one, 
the account of Sarah Leon, prepared by Katajana, will be there. Two, the individual ministries, departments, and agencies, their issues will be there. Three, the parastatus, their issues will be there. Four, we have local councils, they will be there, and any entity that is being audited, those issues will be there. So that is how issues get into the Auditor General's annual report. Some people may want to know, I told you we plan initially. So are all those issues that we plan for the year, will all of them get into the Auditor General's report? The answer is definitely no. We have cut off period. If for all these that are already in their annual plan have not been done prior to the date that will be the cut off date for the Auditor General report to be put together, those issues are rolled over into the subsequent year. Like for 2021 audit, there are institutions that were audited in 2021. We never completed the audit because their audits, as I speak, they are still on but they were actually planned for 2021. So what do we do? We have to roll them over. So when we are doing 2022, if there are material substantial issues, then they come in here. Let me talk about the 2021 report briefly. So now the 2021 report is out. All of us knows about it. And the report is so clear based on all of what I have explained. So if you see issues that is now being discussed <laughs> in the 2021 report. It has been as a result of one, either nothing was done about those issues that were identified during the field work. Two, something was done, but they were not adequately done. Three, they were not done at all. So that's why they are here and they need to be brought to the people of Sayadio. And the good thing about what we've done, we've categorized the issues in seven thematic areas, because based on all our operations, summary of all the operations for 2021 on 2021 account, we realize that the cross cutting issues falls into seven thematic areas. One, it is on procurement issues based on contracts and procurement administration. Two, revenue management. Three, expenditure management. Four, payroll. Five, stores. Six, uh, taxes. The local tax administration. And uh, the number seven is the which one? But it falls in seven thematic areas. So these seven thematic areas are the areas that are on your general standard report, and they were actually service driven, most of the issues. The figures are there, but those figures were actually meant for services. So the service issues is what we are concerned about. And for 2023, we plan, we started engaging, is that we started our audit for 2023, and we hope to have those completed and reported. I believe you may have a lot of these comments, but I'll stop so far and listen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for so eloquently giving me our understanding of the functions and activities of the audit service. So, ladies and gentlemen of the Fourth Estate, you've had it all. Uh, you now have the floor to ask questions, but please, uh, to save time, let us avoid preambles. Go straight to the questions, and then we will take two sets of questions. After the first set, the um, assistant auditor general will respond, and then we will take the next set. So we go. Yes. Tamara.